A continuación, eh, se, se presentará la, el, la conferencia sobre el tratamiento presente y futuro del tratamiento de hepatitis C. La presentará el doctor Pawlowski. El doctor Pawlowski es un especialista en hepatología y gastroenterología. Es profesor de medicina de la Universidad de París y dirige el Centro Nacional de Referencia para Hepatitis Víricas en Francia. Además, es director de otras instituciones de los departamentos de eh, virología de otras instituciones, incluido el INSER. Y eh, ha participado, es un gran investigador, ha participado en más de 450 proyectos y con, con sus publicaciones correspondientes. Además, ha, dado, ha impartido más de 500 conferencias como la que nos va a impartir eh, hoy aquí en este, en este Congreso. Es editor asociado de la revista de gastroenterología y previamente lo fue de gastroenterología y, y previamente de patología y además participa también como miembro en en muchas otras eh, publicaciones y, además, ha sido presidente de la eh, eh, Asociación Europea para el Estudio de las Enfermedades Hepáticas. También es participante activo en otras múltiples sociedades científicas. Por tanto, para nosotros, para GESIDA, es un menor que con esta extraordinaria eh, cualificación pues, se haya dignado a venir aquí a y le agradecemos mucho el que haya podido estar aquí y aceptar nuestra invitación. Además, va a ser un privilegio para todos nosotros, porque ya puedo anticipar que, la, que lo, las expectativas que tenemos de su conferencia son muy, muy altas. Thank you for attending our invitation, Dr. Pawlowski, y you can start the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, long introduction, which I understood, which I understood. I still understand Spanish, I can't speak it anymore, but... Uh... I understand it, so thank you very much for having me here. I'm grateful for the invitation. Always a pleasure to be in Madrid. I know better places, neighborhoods in Madrid than this one, but maybe next time. Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss today the current and future treatment of hepatitis C, and I just want to make the point that you know very well that we have made some progress. And this is a summary of my career. I started my career on hepatitis C 25 years ago, and at the time we were able to cure approximately 10% of patients with hepatitis C, with interferon, standard interferon three times per week for a year, with lots of side effects, poor efficacy, and now we've been moving forward, increasing the rates of cure, and now we are reaching uh, rates of cure which are outstanding, 95, 100% with different regimens. So I think this is a field where we have made progress like the HIV field. So first of all, I would like to describe the currently available uh, HCV direct acting antiviral drugs and you know that the target of these drugs is the HCV life cycle which is a very simple intracellular life cycle with uh, a few steps, receptor binding and endocytosis, fusion and coating that releases the HCV RNA molecule in the cytoplasm where it serves as a template for two essential functions which are the targets of the new HCV drugs. The first one is that it serves as a messenger RNA of our protein synthesis, and the second one it serves as a template for replication. Then the variants are assembled, uh, matured, and transported and released outside of the cell, and we currently have four different classes of HIV direct acting antiviral drugs. Uh, the first class inhibits viral protein synthesis. These are the NS34A protease inhibitors. There are two direct inhibitors of HIV RNA replication that block the function of the uh, polymerase, nucleotide analogs, and non-nucleoside inhibitors. And there are also the NH5 inhibitors, which have a double mode of action. They block viral replication, but they also block uh, transport and uh, uh, assembly and release of viral particles. And this double mode of action explains that they are very important and key in many uh, current uh, combination strategies. So first group, the nucleotide analog inhibitors of the HCV RDRP, the RNA polymerase, they act as chain terminators, are incorporated into the RNA chain information, block its elongation, and there is one drug on the market called sofalbuvir, you've heard, obviously, and used it, but hopefully two other drugs are currently in development, MK3682 and AL335. These drugs have pangenotypic activity and they have a high barrier to resistance. They do select resistant viruses, such as those shown here, especially in vivo the L159F mutation or the V321A, but these viruses are very poorly fit. They don't replicate at high level, and therefore selection has no clinical consequences. And this is why we say, we can say confidently that nucleotide analogs have a high barrier to resistance. Second very important class, the NS5A inhibitors. They block uh, NS5A, which is not an enzyme, it's a protein which is organized 
as you can see here, is a dimer, and the uh, drug binds here directly into domain one of the, of the dimer, and this domain is required for replication, particle assembly, release of our particles, so the blockade is really a global blockade in the cells, and we have many NS5A drugs that have been developed. Currently, we're using the first wave, first generation drugs, Daclatasvir, Ledipasvir, in the ledipasvir sephard bivir combination, and Ambitasvir in the AVV3D combination. Uh, these drugs are pangenotypic except Ledipasvir, which is not active against gene type 2 and 3, and they have a low barrier to resistance. And currently, a second wave of first generation drugs is coming. Elbasvir will be approved soon, Velpetasvir will be approved soon, and Odalasvir and Ravidasvir are in clinical development. They have pangenotypic activity and they may have a slightly high, higher barrier to resistance, but not very high anyway. But we expect that the second generation of NS5 inhibitors will be available soon. And there are two drugs that may eventually belong to this category, it has to be uh, confirmed. ABT530 from AV and Merck has MK8408, pangenotypic activity, and hopefully a high barrier to resistance. I'll show you some data at the end of this presentation with these uh, new drugs. So this slide is a, a, a mapping of uh, NS5A inhibitor resistance. You can see here is the full length of the NS5A protein and many mutations that confer high level resistance to NS5A inhibitors. And more importantly, these mutations confer cross resistance. The same mutations confer resistance to all drugs in the class. And the most important mutations are at position 28, 30, 31, uh, 58, and 93. Third class of drugs, the protease inhibitors. The protease inhibitors, as you can see here, bind tightly into the catalytic site of the protease and block its catalytic action. There are several drugs, again, the first wave, first generation, telaprevir, baseprevir, should no longer be used. Too many side effects. We are currently using simeprevir, pyritaprevir in this 3D combination, and Asians use esunaprevir and veniprevir. These drugs are active against all genotypes except genotype 3, and they have a low barrier to resistance. And there are second generation protease inhibitors. One will soon be available, Grazoprevir, and others are currently in development, ABT493 and GS9857. They have almost pangenotypic activity, but less active against genotype 3 anyway, and uh, probably a higher barrier to resistance. Not as high as nucleotide analogs, but higher barrier to resistance, and you can see here the mapping of resistance, first generation drugs have a low barrier to resistance, and you have mutations that confer cross resistance to all drugs in the class, especially mutation at position 155, mutation 168, and other mutations are more specific for specific drugs. This is, for instance, a case of mutation at position V36 or T54, which are very specific for telaprevir, baseprevir, or the QATK mutation, which is important. Uh, in uh, cimeprevir resistance and, and clinically important. Finally, the last fourth class of drugs we can use is a class of non-nucleoside inhibitors. A few years ago, I had a full slide full of tons of different drugs. They all disappeared, and currently we have only one drug on the market and no other drugs in development. This drug is a POLM1 inhibitor of the RNA polymerase. It's called the Sabuvir. It's part of the AbV3D combination. It is active against genotype 1 only. It has a low barrier to resistance. And you can see here some mutations that are frequently selected by these drugs if given as a monotherapy. S556G and M414T are important mutations associated with viral resistance. So this is what we have. One class of drugs with a high barrier, nucleotide and log three classes with a low barrier. And with this, we can make good combinations with very high sustained biological response rates. And the second part of my presentation, I would like to uh, discuss with you the current recommendation that we prepared for the European Association for the Study of the Liver and were presented in uh, April 2015 at the annual meeting of that association in uh, Vienna. So I think the first point, which is a very important one, is indications, treatment indications. And what we clearly wrote in the guidelines is that all treatment naive and experienced patients with compensated or discompensated chronic liver disease related to HCV who are willing to be treated and who have no contraindication to treatment should be considered for therapy, which means that virtually everybody who is HCV infected has the right to be treated. I think in our discussion with the patient association, this is a very important point. That being said, we also are aware 
that the drugs are very expensive and that most importantly there are many patients to treat and we will not be able to treat everybody right now. So we have to prioritize and prioritizing is not denying treatment to anybody. It's just saying some patients need to be treated now, other patients may be treated later, they will be treated, but there is less emergency. And the list of patients we have uh, put as uh, priority patients are the ones with significant fibrosis, F3 or F4, including patients with decompensated cirrhosis. We have included all HIV co-infected patients, regardless of the fibrosis score, HBV co-infected patients in the pre or post transplant a setting, patients with clinically significant extrahepatic manifestations, patients with debilitating fatigue, and patients at risk of transmitting HCV. And it, as you can see, this priority is a lot of people. It's, it's a large amount of uh, patients with HCV infection. And we also consider at ESOL that treatment is justified in patients with F2, probably not an emergency, but should not be delayed too much. These patients are the ones who will be F3, F4 at some point. Treatment could be deferred in patients with no or mild disease, F0, F1, or who have uh, no uh, extrahepatic comorbidities. So what drugs do we have? What combination do we have now in 2015? Three drugs were approved in 2014. So Falbuvir as a standalone drug, Simeprevir, protease inhibitor active against unit type 1 and 4, and the Clatasvir and S5A uh, inhibitor, pangenotypic activity. So we have two drugs that are pangenotypic, and these are the only ones that are truly pangenotypic. So Falbuvir and the Clatasvir will be important when we speak about unit type 3. And other combinations were approved, the combination of Sofotbivir and Ledipasvir in one single pill in 2015, which is active against unit types 1, 4, 5, and 6, not 2 and 3. And the 3D combination of Ambitasvir, Ritonavir, uh, boosted Paritaprevir, active on unit types 1 and 4, and the Sabuvir that can be used only for unit type 1 patients. And based on this, we hoped, and I had the hope that Having these all oral combination therapies, we would be able to simplify therapy. We're not yet there. It's still complicated. We still have to tailor treatment on a number of different parameters. And the characteristics that are important to inform treatment option selection, which drug, which duration, with or without ribavirin, are shown here. Prior treatment experience, the HCV genotype and subtype, the severity of liver disease, the patient comorbidities, the PK profile of treatment, and potential drug-drug interactions. And based on all this, we have uh, built, I think, what is a comprehensive uh, set of indications for the different treatment regimens and for the different uh, genotypes. So this slide summarizes the treatment options that are available in 2015. At the bottom, we still have in the guidelines two peg front based treatment options. peg front ribavirin sofalduvir which is active on all genotypes, and pegin for ribavirin simeprevir for genotypes 1 and 4. I can already tell you that in the update that we'll prepare for the next diesel meeting in 2016, simeprevir with pegin for ribavirin will disappear, and pegin for ribavirin sofalbivir will remain only for genotype 2 and 3 as a rescue strategy. So we really have to focus on the infantry regiments. And what we have currently is sofalbivir ribavirin for genotype 2, eventually 3, sofalbivir, edipasvir for genotypes 1, 4, 5, and 6. 3D uh, for tune type 1, Sofotbivir, Simeprevir for 1, 4, Sofotbivir, Declatasvir for all genotype. This is the only combination which is pangenotypic so far. And the 2D combination with that, the Sabuvir for tune type 4. So now I would like to not to show you all the data because we'll spend the full day and I not, don't think I'm allowed to do that, but just show you a selected amount of data that illustrate the recommendations we've made for clinical practice. And let's first focus on tune type 1. So there are essentially two cost-effective combinations, sofotbivir, ledipasvir, and ABIS3D. Uh, the sofotbivir, ledipasvir indication is based on the ION trials, which are phase three trials showing very high SVR rates in treated naive patients in ION1, 99%, or in treatment experienced patients, 94%, and also showing that in patients who have a relatively low pretreatment viral load, less than six million IU per ML, you can reduce the duration of therapy to eight weeks without ribavirin. And you can see here that there was no difference in the iron 3 trial between eight weeks of sofosbuvir and ledipasvir and 12 weeks of sofosbuvir and ledipasvir. It's less uh, costly and may help you include more patients in these studies. And there has been recently confirmation from the real life that if you use eight weeks in this group of patients, treatment naive with less than six million, the 
SVR rates are extremely high, so we can use this combination confidently. Uh, the iron 4 trial confirmed that the SVR rates are also very high in patients who are two type 1 co-infected with HIV, treatment neighbor experience with 12 weeks, 96% for gene type 1A and 96% for gene type 1B. A very important study was this retrospective analysis of uh, treatment uh, in patients who had compensated cirrhosis, were included in all the trials, and we showed that the SVR rate in cirrhotic patients with sofosbuvir, ledipasvir, 12 weeks with no ribavirin was 90%. It's not bad, but if you add ribavirin, you go up to 96%, or if you prolong therapy to 24 weeks without ribavirin, you go up to 98%. And this was a basis for our recommendation to use 12 weeks with ribavirin patients with compensated cirrhosis, because the cost is not higher. Ribavirin is well tolerated, but it's not used with interferon and you can really increase substantially the rate of SVR and maximize the SVR rates in patients with cirrhosis. What about patients with decompensated cirrhosis? I think the great news we had was the news from the SOLAR-1 and SOLAR-2 trials showing that with sofosbuvir and dipasvir, we could have high cure rates in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. And just remember that before, we only had interferon, which is contraindicated in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. There was no treatment for patients with decompensated cirrhosis. The SVR rates are lower in these patients than they are in patients with compensated cirrhosis, less than 90%, but still very high. And the important information here is that ribavirin is helpful. It was included in both arms, and there have been confirmation that ribavirin should be used in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. And importantly, uh, 24 weeks did not add uh, to 12 weeks, so 12 weeks with ribavirin in decompensated cirrhosis is the right duration and the right indication. Finally, in the post-transplant setting, we could also cure patients with a very high SVR rate. Ribavirin is recommended in combination with sofosbuvir and ledipasvir. The uh, rate of cure post-transplant is extremely high in patients who have no cirrhosis, still extremely high in patients who have CHALP-UA cirrhosis. But in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, you can see that the SVR rate is going down and more down if the patient has more advanced cirrhosis. And this clearly indicates that if we treat patients post-transplantation, we have to treat them early. And early means as soon as the patient is stabilized. In practice, we recommend treating these patients approximately six months after they have been transplanted, before they have more advanced liver disease and before they lose a chance of curing hepatitis C. This was the first combination. The second one is the combination of ambitasvir, paritaprevir, busid, baritonavir, and desabuvir, with or without ribavirin. Very good results as well. You can see here results in treatment naive patients. This study shows that in patients infected with gene type 1A, it's important to include ribavirin, 97 with versus 90% without, whereas in patients with gene type 1B, ribavirin does not add anything, so no ribavirin patient with gene type 1B. The same study uh, showing uh, the same thing in patients who are treatment experienced. With ribavirin for 1A, 97%. Without ribavirin for 1B, 100%. And more importantly, there were studies with this combination in patients with cirrhosis. Compensated cirrhosis, this uh, combination is currently uh, not recommended in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. Child B or C should not be used, but can be used confidently in patients with compensated cirrhosis. 92% for 12 weeks with ribavirin, uh, 24 weeks, 96%. And the explanation sits here. You can use 12 weeks with ribavirin in most patients who have compensated cirrhosis with this regimen. But in patients who are treatment experienced, have a prior null response to peginfarin and ribavirin, you can see that 24 weeks with ribavirin is doing better than uh, 12 weeks. And this explains our indication of a longer therapy in patients infected with UNTAP 1A or prior not responders that have compensated cirrhosis. In contrast, the patients with cirrhosis who are genotype 1B can be treated 12 weeks without ribavirin, and this uh, study was presented at the uh, American Liver Meeting two weeks ago and shows that on a relatively small number of patients, but all with cirrhosis and genotype 1B, so uh, uh, the 3D combination with 12 weeks and no ribavirin had a 100% SVR rate, so I think in the guidelines we'll amend this and remove ribavirin from the 3D uh, indication patients with cirrhosis. And finally, there was also a study in HIV co-infected patients, including treatment-naive and treatment-experienced patients uh, with or without cirrhosis. And in this HIV 
co-infected cohort, uh, the SVR rates were getting very high. And I guess you're probably using this combination in some of your patients. There are some issues with drug-drug interactions, but I will come back on this in a moment. That was for genotype 1. You can also use Fosbivir, Simepravir, Fosbivir, Daclatasvir in theory. But these regimens are not cost-effective currently, so we generally use the other two. What about genotype 2? Genotype 2, the indication, the standard treatment for genotype 2 is claimed to be Sofobivir, Ribavirin. This treatment is okay for easy-to-cure patients, but probably suboptimal in the current indication. If you look carefully at these uh, initial phase 3 trials, 12 weeks, uh, in patients with or without cirrhosis, treatment-naive patients with no cirrhosis, 12 weeks of Sofobivir, Ribavirin, Perfect, but a bit suboptimal in cirrhotic patients. Treatment experience patients, 12 weeks, uh, non-cirrhosis, very good, but clearly suboptimal in patients with cirrhosis. And even 16 weeks is not enough. We recommended 16 to 20 weeks. I think we now have enough data, especially coming from a boson trial, to say that patients with cirrhosis and genotype 2 should receive sofotvivir and ribavirin for 24 weeks. And you can see here very clearly that Sofotvivir Ribavirin 16 weeks in G-type 2 treatment experienced patient with cirrhosis yielded an 87% SVR rate, going up to 24 weeks optimized, 100%. And peg interferon Ribavirin and Sofotvivir also had a high SVR rate. And we sometimes use this uh, peg interferon based rescue therapy to uh, rescue patients who failed on Sofotvivir Ribavirin regimen in the past, not very often but this can be used. But cirrhotic patients will change the indication in the guidelines for sure. What about genotype 3? Genotype 3 has become the most difficult to cure genotype. Ironically, it was rather easy to cure with peg infrared and ribavirin compared to the others. Now it's more difficult to cure. And if you look at the boson trial, you see that sofotvivir and ribavirin, whatever duration you use, is actually suboptimal. And I personally do not recommend using sofotvivir and ribavirin in genotype 3 patients, 16 weeks, in patients who are treatment naive or experienced with or without cirrhosis, yields a 71% SVR rate. You go up to 84% with sofotvivir ribavirin 24 weeks. If you add peg interferon and treat for 12 weeks, the SVR rate is 93%. And I know that, for instance, our uh, English colleagues treat patients with peg interferon, uh, ribavirin, and sofotvivir 12 weeks because they think this is cost effective. I'm not in favor of first-line peg for therapy. To be honest, patients want something else. They want uh, infront free therapies. And we currently have, I think, very strong data to support the use of sofotvivir plus daclatasvir as the standard of care treatment for first-line therapy of genotype 3 patients. The first state of data came from the ELISE 3 study in genotype 3 patients. Treatment naive and experienced without cirrhosis, and they were good, 97% in treatment naive, 94% in treatment experience with 12 weeks. And additional data was presented last week at the ASLD meeting with patients who were uh, with F3 and F4, more advanced fibrosis, genotype 3. And you can see here that in patients with extensive fibrosis F3, the SVR rate for uh, 12 or 16 weeks of sofotvivir daclatasvir with ribavirin was 100%. And for patients with cirrhosis, it was 83% for 12 weeks and 89% for 24 weeks, uh, for 16 weeks, and I think extending to a longer duration, which was not tested in this trial, is important, and currently in the recommendation, we recommend to use 24 weeks of this regimen of sofotvivir, daclatasvir, plus ribavirin, genotype 3 patients with cirrhosis. What about genotype 4? Genotype 4 is easy to cure, very good results with zombitasvir, pritaprevir, and ribavirin, 100%. And you can also use a or dipesvir with excellent results in treatment naive treatment experience and patients with or without cirrhosis. Genotype 4 is easy and genotype 5 and 6 are easy as well. The good treatment is a or dipesvir with very high SVR rates. So these are the current indications for treatment. And as I said, they will be updated based on the new data that have been presented recently. There are, however, some remaining issues. And I have listed three issues which I think are still pending. Drug-drug interactions, which may be problematic. Patients with end-stage renal disease, who have a contraindication to the use of sofotbuvir. And uh, treatment failures, resistance, and retreatment of these patients. Drug-drug interactions, I'm really not a specialist. There are very good specialists. They are based in Liverpool. They have set up a great website, which is of great clinical use. And I just suggest that when you have to deal with a patient who has many comorbidities, different drugs, Go to the website that will tell you exactly what to do, what drugs you can combine, what drugs you should not combine, 
and what is a good indication. The second issue is patients with chronic kidney disease and stage chronic kidney disease. Uh, there have been a recent uh, presentation at the ACLD meeting of the Ruby one trial, which is a triple combination of ambitasvir, pritaprivir, desabuvir, with rabavarin for genotype 1, without rabavarin for genotype uh, 1A, with rabavarin, no rabavarin for genotype 1B. And you can see here that SVR uh, results were good, 90%, and currently the only treatment we can use in these patients with end-stage renal disease, including patients with dialysis or without dialysis, is a 3D combination. Unfortunately, the 3D combination is available for genotype 1 and 4 as a 2D combination. We cannot use this regimen for other genotypes, and currently we have a problem for genotype 2 patients and genotype 3 patients. We have end-stage renal disease. You can see here that the hematologic impact of ribavirin on the hemoglobin level was not uh, too bad at the end in patients with genotype 1A who received uh, ribavirin. I think an important issue we're currently facing is patients who fail. There are not many patients, but if you look at the real-life data, it will be between 5 and 10% of patients will not be able to achieve a cure with the current regimens. Minority, but problematic minority, and if you look at what happens. These are patients who were treated with a Ledipasvir-based regimen. 16% of them had pre-existing NH5A resistant viruses. 84% did not. At the time of treatment failure, all of them had NH5A resistant viruses. Therefore, these patients who fail on treatment select resistant viruses. Not a surprise for you, HIV physicians. And if you treat them with the AV 3D combinations, they may even select resistant mutations. Again, the three drugs that have been given to them, this is, for instance, the case of these patients who selected viruses resistant to the protease inhibitor, the NS5A inhibitor, and the polymerase inhibitor. What can we do with this? Well, we now know that, uh, in fact, not all resistant viruses are the same. And as you can see here, the uh, mutations that confer resistance to the protease inhibitor, they rapidly disappear and go back to undetectable, and patients have been exposed to a protease inhibitor. The, uh, the subjuvir mutations slowly decline, not that rapidly, but they are associated with the other ones. But the problem we have is with NS5A inhibitor resistant mutation that, when selected, remain very fit, replicating at a very high level and probably forever. Meaning that any patient who has been exposed to an NS5A inhibitor, which means all patients we treat and has failed, has a dominant NS5A inhibitor resistant viral population. And these viral population will be, by definition, difficult to retreat with a regimen containing an NS5A inhibitor. So we didn't have much data at the time we wrote the ESOL guidelines, and we uh, made recommendations based on indirect evidence and subject to change, and, and stated that the retreatment regimen should contain cefalbuvir. Any retreatment should have cefalbuvir because of the high barrier to resist backbone. One or two other direct-acting antiviral drugs, if possible, with no cross-resistance and ribavarin, that we should retreat patients 12 or 24 weeks, but obviously 24 weeks in patients with uh, F3, F4. This was based on nothing, but fortunately, as the last ACL meeting was supported by some data that was presented, and especially uh, data with uh, two studies with a quadruple regimen. The first study was a retreatment study of DA failures with sofodbuvir plus ambitasvir, paritaprevir, ritonavir plus asabuvir in the quartz trial, and you can see here that patients who received, uh, 1A patient who received this quadruple combination with ribavirin achieved an SVR in 92% of the non-serotic, 100% of serotics, and 1B patient who received a quadruple combination without ribavirin cured in 100% cases. So combining sofodbuvir plus the AV3D as a retreatment is, I think, a very reasonable option, was well tolerated in that trial. Another interesting option that was presented for retreatment was, again, a, a, a complex combination of sofabuvir plus the new Merck drug, grazoprevir and elbesvir for genotype 1. And you can see that regardless of the patient characteristics, they all cured infection. So I think really we have options for retreatment. Currently, what we're using at our place is sofabuvir plus the clatasvir plus simeprevir plus ribavarin. Uh, 24 weeks, but we can use Cefalbuvir plus Merck when they're available, or Cefalbuvir plus AbbVie, which is currently available for G-type 1 and for patients as a retreatment and eventually achieve high cure rate in these patients. So 
should we do uh, HIV resistant testing? It's obviously a question I will have and we will probably discuss. Uh, I want to emphasize the fact that the assays are not standardized, that I'm not supportive of doing it prior to therapy given the very high SVR rates you have anyway. If you use the other parameters to tailor treatment, you will have high SVR rates anyway. And doing resistant testing can only mislead you and make you make a wrong decision. However, I think it's important to do resistant testing at the time of retreatment to know exactly what the patient has and decide on the best appropriate treatment for retreatment at this time. We, however, need guidelines for interpretation and retreatment decisions and all these different uh, um, trials that are coming with retreatment strategies are important. Just to finish briefly, I would like to uh, summarize some very recent data that tell us that the story is not finished. You've seen that we have many options. They are very good, but they are complicated, and we want to move forward toward some more easy-to-use combination that will have pan-genotypic activity that could be used as a single regimen with a single duration. In other words, simplification therapy. And there are at least three new regimens that will be approved very soon and can help us move in that direction. The first one is a combination of grazoprevir, a second generation protease inhibitor, with a second wave NS5 inhibitor, Elbesvir. This combination will be approved in Europe in April 2016. The second combination is a combination of sofobivir with a second wave NS5A pangenotypic uh, Velpatasvir, which will be approved probably in June 2016. And probably beginning of 2017, the uh, new AV combination with ABT493 second-generation protease inhibitor, and ABT530, a second-generation NS5A uh, inhibitor. And these combinations, I will show you, have excellent results across different genotypes. Grasopervir albasvir in treatment-naive patients with genotype 1 with or without cirrhosis, genotype 1A, 92%, genotype 1B, 99%. They have a small problem in genotype 1A patients who have pre-existing NS5A resistant associated variants. This will be sorted out in the future. And you can see here in the uh, treatment experience patients, patients who failed on pegin and ribavirin, variant, have one, four, and six with or without cirrhosis, also very high SVR rates, 12 weeks or 16 weeks, from 92% to 97% according to the patient's group and the use or no use of ribavirin. And there was a co-infection study with Grzoprevir and Elbesvir, which uh, yielded SVR rates of 94% in type 1 patients and 95% in genotype 1B patient. This will be another combination that will be available for genotype 1 and 4 patients in the very near future, not available for genotype 2 and 3 patients where this combination does not work. And importantly, this combination is safe in patients with advanced renal disease and can also be used as an alternative to other combinations in patients who have a very advanced chronic kidney disease. And you can see here in patients on dialysis or in patients with no dialysis, type 1 infected, the SVR rates were close to 100%. So it's a safe combination for type 1 patients who have chronic kidney disease. The second very impressive data that was presented at ASLD meeting are with the Fodvivir Velpatasvir. These are the results of a large-scale phase 3 trial in treated naive and treated experienced patients with 20% cirrhosis and different genotypes and you can see here that for genotype 1A, 1B, 2, 4, 5, and 6, the SVR rates were very high, so we're close to a universal treatment that doesn't need pretreatment genotype determination. Uh, there was a specific study on genotype 2 showing that the SVR rate with uh, sofosbivir and patasbivir without ribavirin was significantly higher than with 12 weeks of sofosbivir and ribavirin. And I anticipate that sofosbivir and patasbivir will become the standard of care for genotype 2 treatment. And also, very importantly, for genotype 3 treatment, 95% SVR rate with 12 weeks of sofosbivir and patasbivir versus only 80% for 24 weeks of sofosbivir and ribavirin. So this regimen appears as very promising. And the third regimen, which will come later, but also was very surprisingly and very um, hopefully Promising is a combination of ABT-493 and ABT-530. No nucleotide analog, but two second-generation drugs with improved barrier to resistance. And you can see here that different dose regimens of the different drugs yielded very high SVR rates in treated naive and experienced patients with no cirrhosis here, 97%, 100%. 
and also uh, very good results in genotype 2 patients, close to 100% patients with no cirrhosis, and a very good results, although slightly lower in genotype 3 patients with no cirrhosis, of the order of 93% lower with the lower class of drugs. So you see that we're not at the end of the story, and new combination regimens will be available very soon with improved performance, and hopefully we'll be able to simplify everything at some point. So in conclusion, I think we can say that currently we know that, and this is, I'm sorry my friends, but this is something we do better than HIV doctors. HIV is curable, and uh, the only chronic viral infection which is curable by therapy. Uh, we acquired greater understanding of the HIV life cycle, and this has provided a new toolbox of highly effective interferon-free strategies, which I've tried to illustrate during my presentation. I think the major challenges that remain are in implementation, making these treatments available to the large number of HIV-infected patients, not in France, probably not in Spain, but in many areas of the world, because of the cost, but only the cost, screening, access to care are very important. And obviously, treatment recommendation will continue to evolve as more data becomes available, and I can already announce that the same group, same panel will uh, provide an update of the ESL guidelines after the grazoprevial basvir combination is made available, and later on uh, next year when the safadvivir velpatasvir combination is available. On this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pavlovsky.